All right, good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, uh, Organic Chemistry Part B, ILM 310303EB. Um, pretty long one today, about 60-ish slides or so. Um, good news is there's only three objectives. Um, today we're going to be describing organic families and we've talked about uh, some families already, uh, the alkenes, alkenes and alkynes. Uh, we're going to expand on that with some hydrocarbon derivatives uh, that we mentioned in the previous ILM. Uh, then we're going to describe chemical reactions used to refine the hydrocarbon chain. So we'll talk about characteristics about uh, chain length and industrial processes that are used to modify that chain length in order to get us different products. And the last objective is applying the stoichiometric equation to the combustion of hydrocarbons. And we've looked at this before uh, in analyzers, I believe, when we did combustion. Um, so that shouldn't be anything new there. So that one's not too bad. A uh, few calculations in this objective, but not too bad. So this uh, module is a backbone basically to Alberta's oil and gas industry. Uh, it'll help you understand and identify uh, uses for hydrocarbons and the different refining processes that we apply to them. So starting out with organic families here, uh, the premise behind it is of course grouping information. Uh, if we put them into logical categories, hopefully it makes understanding them easier. Uh, when we group organic compounds together, we call them organic families. And these families will have simil similar chemical properties, physical properties, and the same types of carbon-carbon bonding. So we looked at some of that in the previous ILM. So most of these organic compounds, at least the ones that we're studying, uh, fall into two basic groups. Uh, the first group we've studied in the last ILM, which was basic hydrocarbons, which contain only the hydrogen and carbon atoms in different configurations and different bonds. And then the second group, the focus for today's presentation is hydrocarbon derivatives. Uh, these contain heteroatoms that we mentioned before, uh, which are something other than hydrogen and carbon, uh, in addition to those hydrogen and carbon atoms that we studied earlier. So again, heteroatoms are anything other than hydrogen and, and carbon. And we looked at, uh, I believe in the previous ILM listed, uh, things like bromine, chlorine, fluorine, uh, doesn't matter necessarily what it is, it's just anything other than hydrogen and carbon. So the structure of what we've studied uh, thus far in the major subject of organic compounds, uh, then we looked at the hydrocarbon atoms, the alkenes, alkenes, alkynes, and then the aromatic hydrocarbons or the cyclic uh, shaped hydrocarbons. And then today we're looking at the hydrocarbon derivatives, uh, which contain those hetero atoms. And we'll look at these five different types of derivative families, the alcohols, the ethers, the aldehydes, the ketones, and the amines. And we'll look at them, what they uh, look like in terms of chemical structure uh, and what their purposes and uses are. So just a little bit of um, re revisiting, I guess, aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, a little bit, we mentioned the benzene ring in the previous ILM, uh, and this represented one of the aromatics, the most common aromatic hydrocarbon anyway, um, which was the benzene ring. And we talked about the, the cloud and, and that kind of thing that we mentioned before. Um, so when we have these aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, if we connect more of them together, one or two or three or four or 10 or whatever it happens to be, um, we end up calling them poly aromatic hydrocarbons and a poly just means many. So aromatic hydrocarbons uh, in picture A here are compounds that contain rings of carbon atoms that have alternating single and double bonds. So you'll see single, double, single, double, single, double that is the character characteristic of an aromatic uh, hydrocarbon. Again, benzene being the most popular one. Polyaromatics, just multiple rings uh, fused together here. So just to make something different. Uh, here's that cloud. Maybe we didn't mention it in the last ILM. This is a different way of drawing uh, a benzene ring. Um, as we saw in the previous diagram, benzene had three single bonds and three double bonds. Uh, and the theory uh, says that when it reacts, it behaves like all these bonds are equal. And this kind of next level chemistry is 
as far as we're concerned, probably. Um, people uh, smarter than us believe that the electrons from the double bonds actually distribute themselves equally around uh, those six carbon atoms in the ring, and they have thus called it a delocalized electron cloud, and they've decided that they would draw it a little bit differently here. Uh, and this is probably more common uh, nowadays than it, than it used to be here. And the idea behind taking away the obvious uh, single and double bonds here is, is kind of trying to represent that distribution of electrons. So uh, these, these molecules that we see here are just uh, aromatics that are drawn using this delocalized electron cloud symbol. Uh, and that's the easiest way to do it. So looking at the aromatics in terms of properties, uh, obviously by name, you can assume that they smell. Uh, they're also very toxic and hazardous. They cause cancer. And if they're uh, based on benzene, and fortunately for us, the ones that we're focusing uh, on are based on benzene, they're known as BTEX compounds. And I'll show you why they're BTEX. So here we have benzene uh, by itself. We put a ethyl group on uh, one ethyl group on here, and it becomes toluene. Uh, we put a methyl group on here, or sorry, methyl group on here, it becomes toluene. Put an ethyl group on here, it becomes ethyl benzene. And if we have uh, a couple of methyls on here spread apart like this, it becomes uh, something called xylene. Uh, the BTEX part comes from benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. So you should know these for aromatics, uh, they're the only ones that we're really uh, focusing on. So do know what a BTEX uh, compound is, and it's simply something based on benzene uh, with some type of a branch off of it. Uses for our aromatics, uh, they're produced from crude oil, and they're used in a variety of petrochemical products, including gasoline, uh, polystyrene, polyurethane, and different polymers. And you see that word poly, 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 uh, and here again, that's represented by a single molecule of styrene, and then we join a bunch of them together, and it becomes polystyrene, so many styrenes. So polymerization um, is the, basically by definition in big words here is the com combining of many monomers. One styrene molecule is a monomer, and many is a polymer. So we can call that a monomer if we like. This gets us into the derivatives that is part of uh, objective, uh, first objective here, I still think, or the second objective, I'm not sure now. Uh, again, the derivative is a heteroatom that takes the place of one or more of the hydrogens uh, in a hydrocarbon. So here are the common ones that we're going to study, and they're going to be these functional groups uh, situated somewhere uh, in or on the carbon chain. Uh, as, as a, a modifier to change the characteristics of that particular hydrocarbon. So we're going to look at alcohols, ethers, aldehydes, ketones, and then three different types of amines. And you'll be expected, uh, if we were to give you a, um, a structural drawing of a hydrocarbon with one of these uh, family of derivatives attached to it, you should be able to identify it by its structure, uh, give it a name, uh, and that kind of thing. So let's start out with alcohols here, first of all, which have the OH or hydroxyl uh, functional group here. So they're derived from hydrocarbons that have a hydroxyl or an OH group. The OH group replaces a hydrogen atom in methane, for example, here to become methanol. So we have methane, this hydrogen goes away, this OH comes in and takes, it, takes its place, and then it looks like this with the chemical formula CH3OH. And you can tell it's an alcohol based on the fact that it has this hydroxyl group. Alcohols, when we name them, uh, are ending in OL and have the formula R-OH. Uh, you're going to see this uh, nomenclature as we move through these different families here. And the R part is the hydrocarbon. So in this case, it would be methane with the OH group attached to it. Attached to it. Um, of particular mention here, um, I'll just go through these here. Here I have a methyl, uh, methane with an OH becomes methanol. Here I have uh, ethyl with an OH becomes ethanol. And uh, on a benzene ring here, if I have OH, it becomes something called a phenol. So that's a good little clip Cleveland 
question there. Uses for alcohols, aside from the obvious, uh, fuel when mixed with gasoline, it's a solvent uh, used in antifreeze, used in booze, obviously, uh, and is very flammable. So those are alcohols. Here is ethers, the second family. Um, and we're going to look at basically the same points uh, for each family as we go through them here. We'll look at the structure, uh, the group, or the derivative that we're adding, uh, and a couple of examples of what they are, as well as the properties and uses. So ethers uh, have an oxygen atom in the middle of a carbon chain, and it's not necessarily exactly in the middle, uh, just somewhere between the ends. So in this case here, uh, to look at this, you see we have uh, two carbons over here, which is an ethyl group, two carbons over here, which is another ethyl group. So in this case, the name for this is going to be called diethyl ether, or its common name uh, that you probably would have heard is ether. The general formula for ethers is R, or the hydrocarbon in this case, uh, ethyl, oxygen, and then another hydrocarbon. And again, R is the hydrocarbon, and they may be the same, or they may be different. So in this case, both of these are uh, ethyl groups, and it happens to be right in the middle, but it's not always that way. Uh, here I have um, a propyl group here and a methyl group here. So this will be methyl propyl ether, and again, distinguished by that oxygen in the middle or somewhere in between the ends of the chain. <clears throat> Properties and uses for ether. Uh, very flammable, uh, will per, uh, form peroxides over time and uh, form something new, just a quick claven point there. Uh, solvents for hydrocarbons, uh, still used today as sedatives and anesthetics, and also used for uh, engine starting. If you have a diesel, you probably use ether to fire that up in the winter. So pretty common uh, hydrocarbon derivative. Number three, the aldehydes. So the aldehydes are characterized by having what is called a carbonyl group. Carbonyl group is a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen at the end of a hydrocarbon chain, and it will connect via double bond at the end of a chain. So in this case, again, we're replacing uh, one of the H's, and we're going to end up with this carbonyl group attached to the end of the chain over here. So if you see the carbon with a double bond to an oxygen, that represents the aldehyde. A couple more examples of an aldehyde. The most uh, popular one is formaldehyde uh, from the science lab where they store all the organs and stuff in jars with formaldehyde. Uh, this is a very common one. Uh, another aldehyde over here with that carbon oxygen bond and one that's a little bit trickier over here because uh, we don't show the carbons but everywhere there's a elbow here there's a carbon 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 of course carbons all, all the intersections there um, again in a circle because it's based on a benzene ring phenol something something aldehyde um, again not too uh, not gonna get too deeply into having to name complicated molecules that have these uh, derivative groups attached to them, but definitely recognition um, of that type of a derivative group attached to some type of a molecule. Okay, uh, next up here, what are the uses and properties? Uh, they're very strong, smelly uh, gases usually. Uh, as such, they're used in perfumes, also ingredients in plastics, adhesives, and other chemicals. Uh, used as disinfectants, preservatives, and formaldehyde, if you've ever uh, smelt it, you'll know is a toxic gas at room temperature. Ketones, moving along here quite quickly, uh, have a carbonyl group, a carbon double bonded to oxygen in the middle, in this case, in the middle of a carbon chain. So the same carbonyl group that we saw there, except in this case, it's going to be in the middle of a carbon chain. Formula is RCOR, again, representing that and the fact that it's in between the two ends. And again, these hydrocarbons can be the same or they can be different. So here we have a couple of methanes put on here. 
and we dump off one of these hydrogens, we get this carbonyl group uh, stuck in the middle of the chain here, and it becomes acetone, something that we're very familiar with uh, as a solvent. Again, when we attach it to a ring, uh, it gets that phenol prefix. In this case, it's called phenone. Uh, in this case, it's called acetone. The ketones always end in O-N-E, so only. Properties and uses. Uh, acetone, as you're probably already aware, is a solvent. Um, can be used in adhesives, perfumes. Again, all of these are relatively smelly things. Acetone is... Uh, common, it can dissolve most plastics and synthetic fibers, and also used as a degreaser, so pretty common uh, fluid for, for us. Okay, the last family here is the amines. Amines are a little bit more complicated because we look at three different types of amines. Uh, general configuration is the same with little distinctions that sets them apart. Um, we we use amine, uh, the word here a lot in Alberta, it's used a lot in the oil and gas industry. Uh, you'll learn more about it today if you haven't learned anything about it or why it's so, why it's so popular. Uh, well, what an amine is, is a hydrocarbon that has an amino group in it. And an amino is based off ammonia. Uh, and you can see, uh, if you, you uh, remember from some of the other chemistry we've done with ammonia being NH4, uh, this is an amino group, so N, H, uh, and then the number of hydrogens, how many is what's going to be changing in, in what we're discussing here today. So if it was NH4, it would be ammonia, um, but that's not what we're talking about today, but it is still part of this amino group. So there are three types of amines based on the number of hydrogens or that N value uh, and three separate formulas. And it just has to do with the way that they share their bonds. So if the N equals 2 or the N equals 1 or the N equals 0, they will be a little bit different. So if N equals 2, we're going to call them primary amines. And they'll be attached to some kind of a hydrocarbon with NH2. If they have NH1, they will be called secondary amines. And this is backwards in my mind, but um, you'll have R2 and then N just one H. And then if they're N0, they are called tertiary amines, where we'll have R3 and then N just by itself. And we'll see a couple of new examples here, um, but you will be expected to identify a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine um, visually by looking at a structural diagram. So let's look at a couple here. Um, <clears throat> here I have um, a methyl group here attached to uh, nitrogen with two hydrogens. So this is NH2, and NH2 is a primary amine. And in this case, it's called methyl amine because of that amine group. This one over here has a methyl and a methyl attached to this nitrogen with only one hydrogen. A nitrogen with one hydrogen is a secondary amine. And in this case, it's called dimethyl amine for the two methyls that are attached to it. The last one here, uh, CH33 uh, with one N and no hydrogens at all. Uh, in this configuration here, methyl, methyl, methyl is trimethylamine. And because it only has the nitrogen with no hydrogens in the, in the amino portion, it is a tertiary amine. And amines naming wise will always end in amine. Okay, so methylamine, dimethylamine, trimethylamine, et cetera, et cetera. Properties and uses for amine, very useful here. Um, they're either gases or vaporized liquids at room temperatures. They smell like ammonia. Uh, the liquid version smells like fish, so they're stinky as most of these ones have been. Um, commonly used as a boiler feed water additive to prevent metal corrosion. And its primary purpose that most of us recognize it for is its ability to absorb hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide from natural gas. Uh, that's why it's very common here in Alberta. Um, and the product that we most commonly associate with that is diethylamine. And here we have a combination of a couple things we've looked at today. Here's an alcohol group, in this case ethanol. Here's another alcohol group, in this case ethanol, which combined with this amine and one hydrogen, which is a diethanol amine. And this is one hydrogen, so this would be a 
primary, secondary, or tertiary. I always say secondary. Okay, so let's do a quick review of what we've looked at so far because that was a little bit fast and furious. Um, but all kinds of interesting hydrocarbons and hydrocarbons derivatives. So we've looked at alkenes, alkenes, and alkynes, which we distinguished by the types of bonds, single bond, double bond, or triple bond. Then we looked at cycloalkanes and cycloalkenes, which were similar to above, but in some kind of a ring shape uh, or closed shape anyway, a triangle, square, ring, hexagon, whatever it might be. Um, and then uh, a little bit today uh, of the aromatic hydrocarbons, which again are based on benzene rings. And we talked about the BTEX groups, which was benzene, uh, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. And then we added all the other derivative families here, the functional group for alcohol, OH, ethers, double bonded oxygen, aldehydes, um, and the ketones, and our three amines, the uh, tertiary primary and or tertiary secondary and, and primary amines based on the number of hydrogen primary, secondary, and tertiary. So a lot of background information on hydrocarbons that we've covered uh, thus far. Why do we need to know that? Well, we just because we do all this stuff in the oil and gas industry, and we have to know about some of the things that uh, we're processing out there. The next section, next objective here, deals with hydrocarbon reactions. And this is um, basically bread and butter here in Alberta for sure. Um, hydrocarbons, of course, play an important role here in Alberta. We have access to gas, oil, coal, uh, all of these things we refine into usable products. Um, the products from these fossil fuels, all of them are fossil fuels based off of carbon, are used for heating and feedstock for manufacturing plastic and many different types of chemicals here in Alberta. So we are going to now look at some of the hydrocarbon refining processes uh, for gas, coal, and oil. So we'll do it in uh, little chunks here. First, we're going to look at gas and gas refining. Then we'll look at coal and coal refining. And then we'll look at oil and oil refining. And we'll define some of the processes that are used uh, to modify hydrocarbons into different products. So natural gas refining. Uh, first off here, natural gas is mostly methane. Uh, with some other hydrocarbons and other non-hydrocarbons in it, such as carbon dioxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, uh, gases, uh, other gases, and water as well. So um, it's not pure. We've looked at uh, methane combustion reactions, and we see CH4 plus oxygen gives us this and that and the other thing. The reality of it is natural gas contains many other different things, so they're, they're Combustion reaction is actually more difficult than, than we study, um, but we do have to be aware that there is a bunch of other things in, in the gas that we have to deal with before we can really use it. Uh, sour gas, very common here in Alberta, is natural gas. It contains large amounts of hydrogen sulfide, which is, of course, deadly. We do all kinds of training uh, on hydrogen sulfide. Uh, H2S and, and CO2 are both considered acid gases, which means that they form acid when dissolved in water or when they get up into the environment and condense with clouds form acid rain. They also cause corrosion in metal piping, so we want to do something to get rid of these things. So natural gas refining, the processes that we use to remove H2S and carbon dioxide acid gas and also to convert the H2S into sulfur, uh, which is a usable product in SRUs, which are sulfur recovery units. The sulfur recovery unit um, recovers elemental sulfur and reduces the sulfur emissions of the facility um, as generally uh, as some type of a regulation mandates. So the sulfur recovery unit here, uh, Oh, that's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about removing H2S and carbon dioxide gas first. Uh, so the piece of equipment that we'll use for that is called an absorber. Uh, the process itself is called sweetening. Um, and sweetening by definition is the process that removes acid gas from sour gas in an acid gas absorber. So we pass our sour gas into the absorber. It's filled with some type of a catalyst. 
uh, and we pump an amine comes in, it reacts and forms a salt solution with the acid gas uh, absorbing uh, H2S and the CO2. The, uh, the uh, amine then, that salt solution is sent over to a regenerator to be regenerated. Uh, the H2S and CO2 are taken out of it and that amine solution gets uh, re reused. Um, the product sweet gas comes off the top and goes into future processing. So the uh, most common uh, method to do that is using DEA again, diethyloamine. And we use them um, because the amines are bases and they accept hydrogen ions, the hydrogen ions that are attached to H2S, uh, H2S to form cations. When they react to H2S, they form what is called the bisulfide salt of the amine, which is the here's theorem, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, theoretical chemistry for you about what's going on here. Um, recognizing this formula um, may be necessary um, just by the fact that it has H2S in it here should tell you uh, we're reacting some type of a, an amine with H2S in order to get something and then we're regenerating it back is what's being illustrated here in this particular formula. So using this absorber uh, at any weight at any rate here we're absorbing uh, some of that stuff to in order to get sweet gas. Removing the carbon dioxide it's also acidic and forms uh, carbonic acid when it mixes with water. Uh, water plus carbon dioxide mixes carbonic acid. Um, the carbonic acid in natural gas will also react with amines to form salts, or in this case, bicarbonate salts. And this example is shown here, an amine um, reacting and forming the bicarbonate salts and then going back and forth in this, uh, in this reaction that strips it and then reuses it again. Okay, the amine regenerator, once it gets through there and starts doing its stripping of the H2S and the carbon dioxide, uh, goes into what's called an amine regenerator. This is the second part of the sweetening process and it's recycling basically the amine from the salts that it were generated in the previous process. Uh, when the steam heats the salts, they decompose back into the original amine and the gases. The amine will then be used uh, in the previous step uh, again, to do the primary stripping uh, and the resulting uh, acid gas here is given off uh, for future processing. Uh, in this case, we'll look at how we get uh, the H2S or the sulfur out of this uh, in the next process. So the next process uh, in gas here is converting the H2S that we've stripped out of the natural gas into sulfur. This is done through a process called the Klaus process. And the Klaus process uses a sulfur recovery unit to recover the sulfur from the natural gas. It's the most common way to do it uh, out there. Uh, the resulting product is sulfur, which can be sold uh, for fertilizer or to make sulfuric acid. The Klaus process has two steps. The first step is a high temperature reaction between oxygen and H2S in a furnace, which forms sulfur dioxide and sulfur. So you'll see sulfur dioxide coming out of here as well as elemental sulfur. Um, the sulfur dioxide uh, then goes off into a lower uh, temperature catalytic conversion of that sulfur dioxide uh, and H2S into yet more sulfur. So it'll go, uh, some of it will come out right away, some of it will be reprocessed again, that will be reprocessed again, and through each step we get more and more sulfur out of it. The product uh, left over is called tail gas uh, and I'm not sure if we discuss tail gas treating units. I think we do uh, in, a in, in, in this subject here, but we'll see what happens there. Um, so the closed process anyway, closed process is converting the H2S into elemental sulfur. Here's a bit fancier picture of it here, just showing that's a multi-stage uh, multi process. This is a chemical uh, reaction uh, that happens in this Klaus process here. Um, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide in this reaction will yield us sulfur dioxide, I'm sorry, elemental sulfur 
and water in the perfect world. Okay, so uh, I already said this, but each stage of that catalytic conversion increases the total amount of sulfur produced and thus decreases the total amount of hydrogen sulfide left in the gas. Uh, the remaining gas is known as tail gas, as I said earlier, and it is retreated again in the tail gas treating unit. So I uh, we do mention that, but we don't get into the details. So those are the basic processes for refining uh, natural gas uh, to remove uh, the bad, bad constituents anyway, the H2S and the CO2 out of it. Next uh, bunch of slides here are going to get into coal refining. So coal refining, uh, not as popular as it used to be, but still relatively, still relatively popular uh, in developing nations and still being used in North America quite a bit also. Um, has its own unique challenges, obviously. <clears throat> coal is a very dirty business, but it is the most abundant fossil fuel available. It contains a high percentage of carbon uh, and varies by different types. Uh, coal is classified by different types based on the amount of carbon that it has in it. Uh, I remember this from when I was in third year school as well. Uh, we had to remember three different types of carbon, um, but there's two different classifications uh, mentioned in our ILM, uh, that is sub-bituminous coal, which has less than 70% carbon, and anthracite coal, which has more than 90% carbon. Okay, coal is also the most harmful uh, to the environment as far as a fossil fuel goes. Uh, when burned, it gives off significant amounts of bad gases as well as particulates uh, in the smoke. Uh, so CO2, SO2, uh, we saw these in natural gas as well, um, but here we get SO3, which are sulfur oxides, uh, another constituent uh, that's a, a product of coal refining. So in order to make coal better, they've come up with a process called gasification. Uh, and it's an interesting process where uh, materials that contain a high amount of carbon, aka coal, are converted into a gas, which burns cleaner. The result of the process is a product called synthetic gas or syngas, which is composed, uh, composed primarily of carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas, which we learned uh, about in the combustion analyzer section were both uh, explosive uh, and dangerous gases. Uh, well, we can utilize them as a fuel, so we can get those out of coal, and that's what we do. Uh, the advantages over raw coal lower quantities of pollutants when burned. Uh, we can use these gases as feedstock to synthesize other chemicals and fuels. And we can use this as a gas in turbines. And you'll see that most uh, coal-fired uh, energy plants are doing this gasification process in order to make syngas to burn in their cogens. So let's look at the gasification process here a little bit. Um, the key vessel in the gasification uh, process is called the gasifier. The gasifier is used to provide heat and pressure in order, in order to aid the chemical reaction between water in the form of steam and the carbon in coal. So the formula looks like this. Coal and water in a gaseous form, call that steam, reacts to yield us carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas you should be able to rec recognize this formula here as gasification. And this is a little bit more compl complicated uh, cartoon version of it here basically, but heating up pulverized coal under pressure uh, and no fire will make it give off that carbon monoxide and that hydrogen uh, known as syngas that we use. There are also some other bad things that come out of it as well as you see here. Uh, and we'll deal with those also. So rather simple drawing here. I thought I'd throw in something a little bit more complicated just so you can kind of see it's not as easy as it looks. Uh, this is a, a much more complicated version of the gasification process. So aside from the good stuff produced, again, being hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide, other things are going to happen. Uh, if there's not enough oxygen supplied to the reaction, the other elements in the coal such as the nitrogen and sulfur 
will react with the hydrogen in the syngas, creating ammonia and H2S, and both of these are not desirable. So you can see, um, you can see here, uh, not enough oxygen in the situation, or no oxygen in the situation here at all, uh, yielding H2S and ammonia, uh, both very bad. Sulfur will also react with the carbon monoxide in syn syngas uh, to make something called carbonyl sulfide, uh, which is not, not good either. So how do we get rid of that bad stuff? Well, if we left the ammonia and the H2S and that carbonyl sulfide and the syngas, they would turn into something even nastier called sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. Uh, these are things that are responsible for acid rain, which was the environmental issue of the 80s and 90s, but thankfully we've moved on from that. Um, chemical formula showing H2S and oxygen forming uh, sulfur dioxide and water here. Nothing, don't get too hung up on that. Um, aside from that, the acid rain thing here, these gases are also corrosive and damage catalysts in the processes. So before we can use the syngas, we got to clean it. So we use amine scrubbers to remove the H2S and the COS, same basic machine we saw earlier. Uh, an ammonia scrubber, uh, a new machine which is using a sulfuric acid solution, removes the ammonia by absorbing it and using uh, the remnants uh, as fertilizer. Here's the reaction that goes along with that. I don't necessarily expect you to remember this, but uh, just know that there is processes uh, in order to get rid of the bad uh, constituents in these fuels or hydrocarbons. Uh, liquid fuel, we can make liquid fuel from syngas um, in, in the form of alkanes. It's created by passing the syngas over beds of different catalysts at different temperatures. We don't get into the details, so don't panic. Uh, using an iron catalyst, for example, would create light hydrocarbons that we use in gasoline. Using a cobalt catalyst will create a heavier hydrocarbon uh, like diesel fuel. So. Uh, Here's an example of that formula, theoretically, of what's going on there. Um, in my personal opinion, above our pay grade to be able to uh, understand this given the time that we have. So you can see coal um, through converting it through this process of gasification uh, and a couple of processes, um, getting rid of the amines and the hydrogen sulfide and the CO2s um, can be turned into useful products for us. Last but not least, uh, oil refining, and there's quite a bit of stuff going on here. Okay, oil refining chemical reactions. I need to take a little pause here. All right, <clears throat> so crude oil is not too much different from natural gas in terms of what it contains. Uh, it has the same elements, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, uh, H2S, carbon, um, sour crude, again, H2S. As a result, we obviously need to refine it before we use it. Refining oil is done in a process called distillation. Distillation, if you don't know by now, it's gonna help us, separates components in the crude based on their boiling points. Remember, physical property analyzers. Okay, distillation uh, will break out, um, break down oil into different constituents or products. Some of them include gasoline, jet fuel, diesel, heating oil, uh, different lubricants. Uh, there's different pictures, different diagrams that show all the different products that you can get from oil. Uh, there's a lot more than there is uh, shown here. Distillation process uh, can be at atmospheric pressures and or vacuum uh, at vacuum, uh, and sometimes it's called fractionation. Basically, the difference is kind of splitting hairs. Uh, distillation is generally uh, regarded as splitting something into two, whereas fractionation is commonly understood as splitting something into many different uh, constituents. Okay, so atmospheric fractionation, um, 
First step in distillation here, we distill crude oil at atmospheric pressure into different parts or fractions. So you'll see hotter at the bottom of the distillation column, cooler at the top, we heat things up. Um, the shorter chains evaporate first at a lower temperature and rise up and then condense into shorter chained hydrocarbon products. So gasoline at the top, uh, propane and things like that would be even higher up here. And then the longer chains, jet fuel, diesel fuel, taken off at the lower levels here. Stuff that happens down here that doesn't boil gets moved on to the next step, which would be vacuum fractionation. This occurs under a vacuum surprise. Uh, when we have it under vacuum, it allows us to boil things at lower temperatures. This means things that would have been destroyed uh, by turning the temperature up uh, under atmospheric conditions will now boil at lower temperatures so that we can get the uh, heavier things at the bottom of the column in to, to evaporate so that we can get more products out of them. Uh, they're typically heavier products, um, but we still have to get them out of there. So vacuum fractionation allows us to do that. Now that's really basic, uh, breaking the oil into these different constituents. Once you get these different constituents, there's a lot of other things that you can do with them. Um, that leads us into the next uh, section here, which is conversion processes. Conversion processes has, uh, has to do with modifying the hydrocarbon chain and the structures um, in order to get different things. Uh, when we're distilling or fractioning, the uh, number of carbon atoms is relative to the temperature at which the fraction boils. We saw that on the previous diagram. Uh, we saw that the lower boiling point fractions uh, were lighter and shorter, and then the higher boiling point fractions were heavier and longer. So, for example, the methyl, ethyl, butyl, propyl, they were light, uh, and the lighter ones um, were gases and had typically less than four carbons. And then pentol, which had five carbons and higher, were heavier and were generally liquids. So depending on what we want, if we want to make, say, propane, for example, um, we could take a longer chain and modify it and get some of these lighter things. Or if we wanted to maybe take a couple of these lighter things and add them together, we could get some of these heavier things. Uh, and this is what we're doing in the conversion processes that we're about to look at. So uh, it all has to do with modifying that carbon chain in order to get the characteristics or physical properties that we want. And again, as the carbons increase or the chains get longer, so does the boiling point, and so does the density or the thickness, I guess, of the material. So we can manipulate the size and the structure of the chains in three different rate, uh, three different ways. Uh, and again, we're talking about oil, uh, oils at this point in time. So cracking, reforming, and combining. We're going to look at each of these individually. Names are semi self-descriptive, but not necessarily. So let's look at each one just quickly individually. So cracking, uh, as the name implies, converts long, chained high boiling point molecules into shorter ones. Remember, the shorter ones are lighter and generally worth more. So think gasoline versus heating oil. There's two types of cracking. Uh, first one is called thermal cracking. The second one is called catalytic cracking. So again, we'll have a quick look at both of these. Okay, thermal cracking is a chemical reaction in which a saturated hydrocarbon breaks up under heat and pressure without air, again, without air means that we won't have combustion. Okay, so C16, H34, we apply some heat and pressure to it and snap. It breaks or cracks into two C8, H16, or uh, sorry, an 816 and an 818. But we've broken this long carbon chain into two shorter ones, same carbons here and same number of hydrogens on this side as on this side. So we broke the long chain or cracked it using heat and pressure into two shorter chains. Again, shorter ones generally worth more money. Catalytic cracking, what's different 
it's the same except we use a catalyst. Uh, we use a catalyst again to speed up the reaction. Uh, this allows us to use less heat or activation energy, quote unquote, uh, and pressure which lowers the cost of manufacturing. So again, cracking either thermal or catalytic is used to break a big chain into a smaller one. Second process is called reforming. Reforming uses heat, pressure, and a platinum catalyst to convert low octane straight chain alkanes and cycloalkanes into the aromatic and branched hydrocarbons that make high octane gasoline. This is way out there, but it is what it does. So you've probably seen octane numbers on the gas pumps. Uh, low octane fuel can cause engine knocking and can destroy your engine. Uh, octane boosters are products that are sold that can eliminate this problem. Uh, xylene and toluene, both good examples of um, cycloalkanes, actually cycloalkenes, uh, are common types of octane boosters, and they are very, very light. Um, catalytic reforming uses two reactions, and they are called dehydrogenation. Dehydrogenation, which means dehydrogen, so taking away hydrogen or the loss of hydrogen atoms. And the second one's called isomerization, which is, as you we talked about isomers before, which were the same number of things, just in a different formation. So we're going to take a straight chain and we're going to turn it into a branch chain. And when we talked about isomers earlier, uh, you saw that it was as we isomerized or looked at different isomer, isomers of the same compound, we saw that we got different boiling points out of it. So again, that has to do with the product quality when we're talking about uh, distillation. Okay, so <clears throat> back to the painful part here, dehydrogenation. So the loss of hydrogen from the molecules uh, to allow the formation of aromatics, which are worth more. So losing the hydrogen allows for the double bonds. Okay, so here we have a cyclohexane, as you see, all single bonds. And then we take away a couple of these hydrogens we take away the hydrogens, that means uh, those bonds aren't used anymore, and boom, boom, we end up with a couple of double bonds in here. So that's dehydrogenation, allowing you to take an alkane or cycloalkane and turn it into a, a, a benzene. Okay, marvelous. So that's dehydrogenation. Second is isomerization. So again, all we're doing is taking a straight chain and turning it into a branch chain. Here's an example of octane with eight carbons uh, getting converted into a uh, hexane uh, with six carbons. Here we have uh, a methyl group here and a methyl group here. So this is two, five dimethyl hexane, same numbers of carbons, same numbers of hydrogens overall on each side, but this is overall a shorter chain. So it's lighter, so it's worth more. So this is what isomerization does for us. And this again is a method of reforming. So same thing, just reform them. So cracking, reforming, the third method is now combining. Combining just like it sounds, two or more smaller molecules combine into a larger branched molecule alkenes which are unsaturated and again this works a lot better with unsaturated things because they're capable of bonding saturated uh saturated hydrocarbons won't react because they don't have any bonds that can be broken so alkenes which are unsaturated double bonders are great for combining so just to make it a little more complicated two types of combining the first type is called alkylation which is combining an alkene with a branch chain alkane. So here we have an alkene, here we have an alkane. We break, we break this bond here that allows them to hold hands. And we now have 224 trimethyl pentane made by combining this methyl propane with this methyl propene. Fascinating stuff. Polymerization combines two or more alkenes into one. In both cases, a double bond is broken 
to create something new. Okay, so just combining a single bond and a double bond, alkylation, double bond, double bond, polymerization. Lots of things today to learn. Okie dokie. Hydro treating, another refining process, has nothing to do with water. Hydro treating is the process of adding hydrogen. Hydro treating in a catalytic reaction to alkenes and alkynes. Why do we use alkenes and alkynes? Because we couldn't add a hydrogen to an alkane because it has no available bonds. It's all saturated. So alkenes and alkynes are unsaturated. So that's why they can do this. They can take a hydrogen in the hydrotreating process. So by doing that, we turn them into alkanes. Hydrotreating converts unsaturated alkenes and alkynes and aromatics into alkanes. It also removes sulfur, nitrogen, and metal impurities. So very fascinating, very marvelous. Uh, hydro treating, uh, hydro treating upgrades oil sands bitumen into synthetic crude oil. So there is something that may have some relevance to us. So here you see uh, taking a alkane, combining it with this alkene, breaking the bond, and getting a new compound, which is a branch chain single bonded alkane. From this, we could do other things if we wanted to. Okie dokie. That was a lot of processes, um, but it's good to know some background about the industry that we work in, particularly here in Alberta. So this last objective, hydrocarbon combustion, starting on page 38, should be more or less a review of everything we've talked about before uh, with a little bit of sneaky map in here, but nothing too terrible. Okay, for review, hydrocarbon combustion is the reaction between a hydrocarbon and oxygen. The result is combustion products, hopefully uh, CO2, water, and heat. The amount of heat and products is related to the amount of oxygen used in the reaction. We learned about the consequences of too much and too little. Complete combustion, we defined earlier, uh, will generate the most heat um, because we have enough oxygen present to convert all the carbon atoms into carbon dioxide and all the hydrogen into water, and life was grand. If we had incomplete combustion, that meant we didn't have enough oxygen uh, and we didn't get carbon dioxide, we got carbon monoxide, and that was bad, and we also produced less heat, which costs more money, which is also bad. We then learned that stoichiometry refers to the use of a balanced equation to calculate the exact quantities of reactants required for that reaction to take place. Then we learned that the balanced equation will tell us a ratio of each type of molecule. And then from that, if we wanted to, we could calculate the mole relationships of the substances. And we could also calculate the masses and of the reactants and the products. It was all marvelous. <clears throat> Long story short is if it was all done correctly, all of the reactants would be used, there would be no bad byproducts, and a maximum amount of heat would be produced in an exothermic reaction. Whole all kinds of theory come together in one slide. Okay, so we also learned that it doesn't necessarily happen this way, um, and that's why we had extra oxygen, but that was a different ILM. This ILM is all about theoretical combustion and stoichiometry. So using stoichiometry, we can determine the ratio of oxygen to the fuel to ensure we have complete combustion from that combustion formula. The numbers in front of the, uh, numbers in front of the act, uh, reactants indicate, indicate the ratio, right? Again, one part methane, two parts oxygen. That's what we get, complete combustion. Here we have uh, four parts methane and seven parts oxygen. And we got carbon monoxide here, so incomplete combustion. So we learned about the air fuel ratio and the oxygen fuel ratio and all that wonderful stuff before. Um, but now we're going to expand on that a little bit here. And we're going to say now, if we have two 
oxygen and one fuel in this example here. Same as saying that we need two moles of oxygen and one mole of methane. Once we have the moles, we can then calculate the mass of each of these components that's required. I don't know why we would want to, but we can and we will. So the mass again is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass for that particular element here. So methane is 12.01 plus 4.04, .04, so about 16 grams per mole. Uh, oxygen is, as a gas, is 2 times 16 or 32 grams per mole. And we got two of them. So we're going to say that 16 grams of methane and 64 grams of oxygen will burn and give us CO2. And we can do the math here, 12 grams, 16 grams, add that up add that up and you'll find that the grams and grams all math up and the C's and the H's all math up and all other stuff maths up. So it's pretty good. We can always check our work by making sure that everything adds up or maths up as I like to say. Okay, uh, incomplete combustion occurs when there's not enough oxygen to react. Uh, we get CO, that's bad. Um, yeah, we, we know that CO can burn, but we're wasting money and we're polluting, so bad, bad, bad. So let's look at the calculations that they expect us to do in this ILM. <clears throat> Calculate the mass ratio for the stoichiometric combustion of propane. So first we have to do some balancing uh, in order to get our uh, coefficients here. So here, given we have five moles of oxygen to one mole of fuel, in this case, propane, the mass is going to equal the number of moles of each thing times the molar mass. So what do we got? Five moles of oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is uh, 2 times 16 or 32, and we have five of them. So 5 times 32 is 160 grams of oxygen. Then over here, we have C3H8, which is 3 times carbon at 12 and 8, time hydro eight times hydrogen at 1 which is 44.09, so add those together. Um, I get a ratio of 160 grams of oxygen to 44 grams of propane. Does not feel, does not feel good? Okay, different way to do it. Calculate the mass of carbon dioxide produced from the complete combustion of 12 grams of ethane with oxygen. Sorry, we have to go through this, but we do. Okay, so here's our formula. Um, C2H6 combined with seven oxygens gives us four carbon dioxides and six waters. So here's our uh, oxygen fuel ratio. Do our mass calculations. So C2H6 is 30.07 grams per mole. We only have 12 grams of it. So 12 goes into 30.4, so we have 0.4 moles. Then we have uh, to find a ratio here. So we've got four moles of carbon dioxide uh, out of the two moles of fuel. So two to one times 0.4 tells us that we have 0.8 moles of CO2. 0.8 moles times the molar mass of CO2, which is 44.01 grams, tells us that in this reaction, we will get 35 grams of CO2. It can be done. It hurts a little bit, but it can be done. All right, so just like we talked about theoretical combustion with oxygen earlier, and then reverted to air, uh, because obviously oxygen is great, but it is expensive and air is cheap, so we have to do some calculations using air. <clears throat> so air is 21% oxygen, so in order to get the same amount of oxygen, we have to do what? Multiply by 4.76, remember that magic number? So to convert air to oxygen, we have to multiply by 4.76. So what are we trying to do here? Uh, methane plus oxygen, you know, it's carbon dioxide plus water. So in order to get percent into the mole ratio, we have to multiply by 100. 
So one mole of air, for example, as we know, has 20.9 or 21% oxygen in it, or 0.21. So if we have two moles of it, times 0.21, times our 4.76, gives us our 9.52. Okay, so 9.52 moles of air is the equivalent of two moles of oxygen. We can then find the moles of nitrogen the same way. In air, we have 0.79 moles of nitrogen. So in 9.5 moles of air, we would have 7.5 moles of nitrogen. So the formula using air looks like this. Da, 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 da. Right? Incomplete combustion. Nice. Don't worry too much about that. Um, biggest thing to remember uh, that I wanted to reinforce here is making sure that you understand that in these calculations, when we're theoretically talking about oxygen, in order to do the same calculation with air, you have to know you have to multiply the number of moles by 4.76 in order to get that same amount of oxygen, elemental oxygen. That is done. The end. That was a long and painful presentation. I hope you're all still awake. Have a good day.